Larry, who, who did have the closing prayer? Because I did not hear what you said. Who? Curtis, okay. Curtis, why don't you go ahead and lead us in a closing prayer, just in case anybody feels the need to leave as we get into this study. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you permitted us this peaceful time to assemble here, gather together, and praise you, praise your name, study from your word, offer our petitions to you at this time. Father, we acknowledge our weaknesses and our frailties, and we pray that you will look down on us in your tender mercies. Forgive us as we repent of our sins. Help us, Father, as we look to your word this hour. We pray that as we study from it, it will help us to grow stronger in the faith. Help us to better resist Satan as he places those temptations before us. Father, we're thankful for this church, for what it stands for, and we're thankful for the leaders that we have. We pray that you will give them the strength and the wisdom that they need to go, go about their duties. Father, now at this time, we pray for Devin as he opens your word to us, and talks to us about your word. Be with him and give him strength and wisdom that this study might help us as we look to your word for our guidance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yeah. I appreciate that, Curtis. I, I wanted to make it known to you that if for some reason you need to leave during this study, you will not offend me because once we get started in the midst of it, it's going to take us a little while and I'm going to move it as quickly as I possibly can. For you that typically attend with us and have sat through some of my classes, you know how quickly I can move through the material. So we're going to move. We're going to move at a pretty good pace. I would advise you to write down any questions you may have. My notes are, nor, are more structured this class than they normally are, so if I have a couple of words that don't make any sense to you, write it down, and I can probably find where it was in my outline. So please write down your questions. I would also say that if some of this is something you are really interested in, then you know you can come and talk to me. And I have a whole lot more stuff that I did not have time to bring into this lesson or this discussion. For more references back to the manuscript stuff we're going to talk about, you can look back at a lesson I preached in August of last year, August 15th, which Bible should I use, where I talk a little bit more about manuscripts and the translations and transmission practices. A lot of this is academic, and I recognize that. But I will do my best to keep it as entertaining and as informative as possible. And in the process, I might cure uh, uh, narcolepsy. There we go. And I might find out what word it is, too. We'll see. Maybe by the end of this, I'll tell you what it is. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. This is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and verses 17. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. But the question then is asked, how do we know the limits of Scripture. What is the all in the verse? Every few years, a long-lost epistle is discovered, and it begs this question, do we have all Scripture? And then works like the Da Vinci Code come out, and it really paints this, this dark picture. It brings all of this back up to the forefront of the person struggling with their faith or to the skeptic's mind. And it always paints this image of dark, smoke-filled dungeons and robes covering nefarious individuals who are no doubt smoking cigars with big handlebar mustaches and having maniacal laughter about how all the people they're fooling. But is that really what happened? Is that the process that led us to our scriptures? Did the Roman Catholic Church or some other ecclesiological organization give us the Bible? There is a threefold relevancy to this discussion, and so I would ask you to listen very carefully. The first time our kids hear about things like this does not need to be in a college class with an atheistic or a militant agnostic professor who absolutely hates the idea of God and doesn't care one whit about them. This needs to come from people who love them and love God, folks. I know people who have lost their faith because they'd never heard about the Gospel of Thomas. And all of a sudden, why don't we have that in our Bibles? And it just destroys them. They need to hear it from people that love them and love God. Number two, there's a principle in this discussion. Filter everything you see, hear, read, think, feel through Scripture. 
And as we pick this apart, we'll determine what is Scripture and what is not. And number three, we need to be equipped to handle a skeptical world. There was once a time in our culture, because it was so Christianized in the American people's culture, you could talk to people about what a passage meant and what it, what it was teaching. It's not that way as much anymore. Now you've got to convince people that there is a God, that He spoke, that this is His book, His Word, and that it is all of His Word. And so hopefully this will help equip you to handle a very skeptical world. The rising popularity of things like textual criticism. Previous generations didn't have to know this stuff, but with the age of information, we need to know this stuff. We need to be equipped to handle the the credibility of Scripture. Individuals like Bart Ehrman. There was a man by the name of Bruce Metzger who was a phenomenal biblical scholar of the last century. Well, Bart Ehrman studied underneath Bruce Metzger. Bart Ehrman was a devout evangelical Christian for most of his life and in the last few decades has now renounced his faith. He is agnostic. He went from writing books about the credibility of Scripture to now he has written a plethora of books that destroy the credibility of Scripture. Your your children need to find out about people like Bart Ehrman from people that love them. The process of the canon is a messy process and it did take time. That is not a problem though. Being that it is messy just proves the fact that they didn't throw everything into the canon. They were, they were picky. They were picky about what went in to the books. James White, a, a modern-day theologian, says, God creates canon by inspiring some writings and not others. Canon, then, is a part of revelation itself. It is an artifact of revelation, not an object of revelation. Man's knowledge, therefore, of canon is passive, not active. Man or church does not create canon. It seeks to recognize canon. It should come to no surprise to us that God inspired some works and didn't inspire others. I'm going to list a lot of books throughout this study. We could spend a little time dissecting each and every one of them, but for the sake of time, we will not. And if time allows, we'll discuss some typically disputed books at the end of the lesson. Let's start by defining just a few terms here. All of these taking from the Oxford Language Dictionary. The first one is canon. The word canon is a general rule or law or principle or criterion by which something is judged. It is a rule, a measuring rod, we might say. It came to be called the collection of sacred books listed as genuine. The canonical word is one that shows up now. It is a recognized part of that rule. It is canonical, accepted as accurate and authoritative. Canonization is the process of determining what is part of that rule and what should not be. Admission or so into the canon. Apocryphal. This is of doubtful authenticity, even though it might have been circulated widely at different times. Proto-canonical. Deuterocanonical. Let's start with that one. Deuterocanonical is the secondary canon. So not primary, but secondary. And of course, proto-canonical is the primary and it is typically those accepted books that had no serious controversy whatsoever. Pseudopigraphic is spurious or pseudonymous, meaning it's written under a false name or a false pretense. And so those be, became a, that became a traditional word describing the Jewish works of antiquity about 200 years before Christ on up until after Christ. It is only fair to recognize that these definitions change depending on which source you look at. If you look at the word baptism in the same, defi- or the same dictionary, you do not see what the Bible reflects as baptism. You don't see it is for the remission of sins. You don't see that it is a part of salvation. You don't see anything like that. So it's only fair we acknowledge that. Now, if you were to consult other authorities, Deuterocanonical, as an example, is referring to the list of books or passages of the Old Testament about which there was controversy at one time in early Christian history. In the Old Testament, they are Tobit, Judith, Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, First and Second Maccabees, parts of Esther and Daniel. The New Testament, it is Hebrews, James, Second Peter, Second and Third John, Revelation, Mark, the last 12 verses. All of these are recognized by the Catholic Church. All of these are recognized as part of the biblical canon. Among Protestants, the Deuterocanonical books of the Old Testament are rejected as apocryphal along with the last 12 verses of Mark's Gospel. Now, obviously, I would disagree with the definition they give for that, but again... It depends on who you're talking to as to whether or not that is the exact definition they would themselves use. Obviously, the last half of that statement is not necessarily accurate. Let's start by the canonization of the Old Testament. 
If you were to pick up your Bible and compare it to various other religious organizations out there, there would be some noticeable differences in some cases. The 39 books of our Old Testament in the Roman Catholic Church, it's 46. The traditional apocryphal books, 1st Esdras, also known as 3rd Esdras, 2nd Esdras, also known as 4th Esdras, or the Apocalyptic Esdras, the way they number Esdras depends on whether or not they call Ezra and Nehemiah 1st and 2nd Esdras. Esdras, I've said it a billion times, is the Greek word for Ezra. So Ezra and Nehemiah are in some cases called 1st and 2nd Esdras. And so that depends there. Tobit, Judith, additions to Esther, wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, or wisdom of Jesus, the son of Sirach, or just Sirach. Baruch, letter to Jeremiah, sometimes incorporated in the last chapter of Baruch. Prayer of Azariah and the Song of the Three Young Men, Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, Prayer of Manasseh, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th Maccabees, Psalm 151. I think I got it pretty close. Roman Catholic Church accepts all of them with the asterisk beside it. The Eastern or Greek Orthodox and Russian churches accept a variation of that list, in some cases including it in their Old Testament appendix. The traditional pseudopigraphic writings, written between 200 B.C. and A.D. 200, I want you to notice they're often attributed in some form or fashion to a notable Bible character. So please notice that. The Assumption of Moses, Ascension of Isaiah, the Book of Enoch, or First Enoch, brought up sometimes because of Jude verses 14 and 15, which we'll hopefully get to. The Book of Jubilees, the Sibylline Oracles, Psalms of Solomon, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, which is an alleged, I want to emphasize, alleged record of the deathbed speech of the Twelve Sons between 200 B.C. and 250 A.D. Letter of Aristeus, Martyrdom of Isaiah, Book of Adam and Eve, Second Enoch, or the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, Second Baruch, or the Syriac Apocalypse of Baruch, Third Baruch, or the Greek Apocalypse of Baruch, Perk Abbath, the story of a hiker, not a hiker, by the way, Fragment of a Zedekite work. So you have a long listing of various books that are not in our Old Testament. It should come as no surprise that God spoke and man then wrote. And so in the Old Testament, man wrote on scrolls, and the ancient Old Testament of our Old Testaments were written in Hebrew. Eventually, well, with the exception of just a few spots that were in Aramaic, a few chapters in Ezra, a few chapters in Daniel, one verse in Jeremiah. You can actually see parts of this, by the way, in Exodus 24, where Moses then wrote the words God told him to write. Exodus 24 and verse 4, and then in verse 7, Moses then opens the book of the covenant to read to the people. There's your first witness of the canon right there. So then the Hebrew scriptures were eventually translated into the Greek, the Septuagint or Septuagint it is sometimes called. In your Old Testament, sometimes you'll have a footnote in the bottom of your Bible where it says LXX, that is the Septuagint. It is the numeral for 70, which were the closest number to the number of scribes they used and scholars to translate it. Translated in Alexandria, Egypt, between 280 B.C. and 180 B.C. This was the common scriptures of Jesus' day. It is obvious, it is evident by the way the New Testament writers quote it. Almost every single quote in the New Testament of the Old is the Septuagint. Okay? Now, there was a sect of the Jews called the Masorites who transcribed the Old Testament. The Talmud, which is a collection of Jewish writings from a, the first few centuries A.D., details the process that they endured to make the transcription of the Old Testament. Extreme caution went into this. You can see how they preserved their ancient writings. That is rather small, I know, but I will read it to you. A synagogue roll must be written on the skins of clean animals prepared for the particular use of the synagogue by a Jew. These must be fastened together with strings taken from clean animals. Every skin must contain a certain number of columns equal throughout the entire codex. The length of each column must not extend over less than 48 or more than 60 lines, and the breadth must consist of 30 lines. The whole copy must be first lined, and if three words be written in it without a line, it is worthless. The ink should be black, neither red, green, nor any other color, and be prepared according to a definite recipe. An authentic copy must be the exemplar from which the transcriber ought not in the least to deviate. No word or letter, not even a yod, must be written from memory, the scribe not having looked at the codex before him. Between every consonant, the space of a hair or thread must intervene. Between every word, the breadth of a narrow consonant. Between every new persha or section, the breadth of nine consonants. Between every book, three lines. The fifth book of Moses must terminate exactly with a line, but the rest need not do so. Besides this, the copyist... Look, listen to this. The detail that went into their work. Besides this, the copyist must sit in full Jewish dress, 
wash his whole body, not begin to write the name of God with a pen newly dipped in ink, in ink, and should a king address him while writing that name, he must take no notice of him. The scrolls in which these regulations are not observed are condemned to be buried in the ground or burned, or they are banished to the schools to be used as reading books. You can see the extreme caution that went into these people preserving the text of God. By the way, how good they were at their job is also proven by the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. Works separated by, oh, just a couple thousand years, and the only differences between the two texts boil down to some grammar and spelling differences. That's remarkable, folks. The Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God, Paul said in Romans 3 and verse 2, and historically they took care of their job. So the question is, why do we not accept the apocryphal writings as inspired of God and canonical. A couple of reasons. Number one, historically, they were not recognized as canonical. There is no substantial evidence that attributes inspiration to these texts. Please remember, and we forget this sometimes, but the Old Testament scriptures were the history book of the nation. That's what it was. It was their history book. And so they learned their history through these writings. Now, it's occasionally brought up as a defense. What about the apocryphal writings being in the Septuagint? That is true. When you opened the Septuagint of Jesus' day as an example, it had the apocryphal writings in it. But please notice, in the earliest editions of the Septuagint, the apocryphal writings were not there. They were added in at a later date. And I'll say more on that in just a second. What about some of the apocryphal writings being found in among the Dead Sea Scrolls? And that's true. When they, dig the, they did the digs of the Qumran Caves in 1947, they found scrolls of ancient antiquity as Isaiah and many others, and then they found some of the other apocryphal writings. Now, just because you find a book in someone's library does not mean they believed this book to be inspired. I promise if you bury my library and dig it up in a thousand years, you should not automatically assume I think anything in there is inspired. Much less, who cares? I'm going to say that a lot tonight, by the way, so you just buckle up, folks. Who cares? So, further than the historical reference, let's consider this. Jesus and the apostles never attributed any inspiration to these works, even though there is no doubt they were very familiar with them. The Septuagint was the primary Bible of Jesus' day. It was the scriptures they used and they knew, and yet not one time does Christ or the apostles ever quote from the apocryphal writings. By the way, that alone doesn't prove anything. I've already quoted from several people in this study that I do not believe to be inspired. There's many times I quote something to show an illustration of a wrong view. So just because you quote something doesn't automatically mean you believe it to be inspired. And in the case of the New Testament authors referring to the Old, Please consider passages like Acts 1 where Peter says, and Luke records, the Holy Spirit said through David. And statements like that are repeated several times. Acts 1, Acts 28, Hebrews 3, 4, 9, 10. And I believe the as it is written phrase that is found numerous times in the New Testament attribute to some degree inspiration, more than just citing a source. But to be clear... It is sometimes brought up, those who seek to defend the apocryphal writings, it's sometimes said, well, there are quotes of apocryphal works in the New Testament. Let me give you a couple. There's a bunch, but I'll give you a few of the highlights. Matthew 6 and verse 19 and 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. They say is a quote from Sirach 29:11. Lay up your treasure according to the commandments to the Most High and it will profit you more than gold. Please consider a second one here. Matthew 7 verse 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, you also do to them. This is the law and the prophets saying, Tobit chapter 4 verse 15. And what you hate, do not do to anyone. Those are two of the primary ones that I found first and fastest. Okay? There's others, but please notice this. When Jesus quoted Scripture in other passages, it was so painstakingly obvious that you couldn't deny it. Look at just three passages. Don't turn to it. We don't have time. But look at the three passages here, all within a few chapters in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus says, God commanded. By the way, when he quotes Exodus and Deuteronomy in that passage, it is a direct word-for-word -word quote. There's no mistake who he's speaking about. Or Matthew 19, have you not read? And then later in that same section that God said, 
or consider Matthew 22. You're mistaken not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. And he goes on to say, God said this in a direct word-for-word quote. That is not what he's supposedly doing with these other quotations. They are not the same. Number three, they were not accepted by any early writers. Josephus, a Jewish historian, he said there were 22 books of Holy Scripture. Yes, I can do math. 22 is not 39, but it is the same books counted differently. We break them up, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. In the Jewish canon, they were not broken up. In fact, Ezra and Nehemiah were one volume in the Jewish canon. So same books counted differently. But there's Josephus living about the time of Christ. Or Philo, as a contemporary of both of those men, Jesus and Josephus, seems to indicate a same understanding. Or the Council of Jamnia, which was a Jewish council of canonicity that took place in AD 90, recognizing the same thing. If that was not enough, there is 2nd and 3rd century Christians. Milito in AD 170, Origen and Athanasius and even Jerome. And Jerome is quite important because Jerome was the first man to translate the scriptures into the Latin language, which became the Latin Vulgate, which became the Roman Catholic Bible. He did not believe these to be inspired. Nowhere before, nowhere do we see evidence of this. Augustine seems to be one of the earliest Christian writers in favor of them, and he lived between 354 and 430. Further than that, when you read these books, there's no intrinsic qualities of inspiration. Historical, chronological, geographical issues, and in fairness, we need to acknowledge this could be an interpretational issue of some kind. But when you consider it along with these other issues, this problem becomes very tough to figure out, or they're not inspired. And so we must choose very carefully. I'll give you a few passages that some throw out that say, uh, or, or that we should at least observe in this regard. The inconsistencies. Judith chapter 1, verse 1. It was the twelfth year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar who ruled over the Assyrians in the great city of Nineveh. A seasoned Bible student has already picked up on the problem in the verse. Nebuchadnezzar was king of the Babylonians in Babylon. There is a problem there in Judith 1 and verse 1. The author of the book of Judith, in complete disregard of history, represents him as flourishing after the exile. Some scholars believe the historical confusion, listen to this, is deliberate to identify it as fiction. That is a host of scholarship from the New Revised Standard Committee. Or or to consider the the book of Baruch. Baruch pretends to be written by Jeremiah's companion. Baruch was a real person. But this individual, pretending to be Jeremiah's companion, wrote during the Babylon supposedly wrote during the Babylonian committee or captivity, but actually was written much later, some say the first century AD. In fact, the New Revised Standard Committee puts it around two hundred BC to sixty. B.C. or thereabouts. Certainly Baruch himself would not have made the numerous mistakes contained in Baruch 1 and verses 1 through 14. There is a problem here, folks, a consistency problem. These books have been constantly rejected because of their spurious nature. They did eventually gain some recognition among the Greek-speaking churches, which is what led to their inclusion in the Latin Bible. But please appreciate, not even the Roman Catholic Church accepts all the books that were in the Septuagint. Not all of them, just some of them. We need to acknowledge they were certainly, they carried certain historical accounts that may be worthwhile. They are historical books. That's what they are. And so they do reflect some things that are worthwhile in those historical contexts. But that does not make them inspired. And so much so, even the Church of England recognizes this, and I like the way they say this. They may be read in public worship but not in order to establish any doctrine. They have worthwhile historical information, but that's the extent of these books. There's a problem with these particular writings. Now, when you consider some of the uh, Council of Trent as, as an example, and this is Lightfoot, excellent little book on this topic, objections to these books cannot be overruled by dictatorial authority. April 8, 1546, the fourth session of the Council of Trent, the Roman Catholic Church, pronounced the Old Testament apocrypha, except for First and Second Esdras and the Prayer of Manasseh, as authoritative and canonical scripture. This was done even though, in different periods of its own history, officials of the Roman Catholic Church had been outspoken against the apocrypha as scripture, but this action was not unnatural for a religious body whose whole structure is framed according to traditions, whose faith is derived equally as much from the fathers and popes as from the scriptures. It appears the apocrypha 
would never have posed a serious problem were it not for the usurped power of Rome over Scripture. Yet Rome, with all of its infallibility, cannot make the fallible Apocrypha infallible. I especially like that last sentence. You cannot make a book that's wrong all of a sudden right. You just can't. When there's inconsistencies, they must be noticed. James White put it like this, How did the godly Jew 50 years before Christ know what was Old Testament Scripture? How did he know Isaiah and 2 Chronicles were Scripture? Well, some say he couldn't or he didn't know because outside the Pope, no one could. The problem with that, Jesus held people accountable to the Scriptures. Matthew 22, Have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm not the God of the dead, but of the living. He held men accountable to those Scriptures. If he held them accountable, there had to be some way they knew Isaiah and 2 Chronicles were Scripture. The problem when you kick this off to some magisterium is there's an inconsistency. If the Jewish magisterium, which is supposedly appointed by God, said a 39-book canon, and then another magisterium, supposedly appointed by God, says a different number, well, then you've got two magisteriums appointed by God that are conflicting with one another. Or, or someone is flat out wrong. So how did the godly Jew in the first century know what was God's and what wasn't? In a very similar way that we do, folks. You test the Scriptures, 1 John 4. You look at the Scriptures, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. God's Word is designed to make one complete. And so these books, whatever they may be, will support that endeavor. And by the way, Galatians 1 would be a great example of this as well. If there's a conflict, then it's not from God. God does not put out conflicting teachings. People sometimes interpret them wrong. Now let's move on to the New Testament very quickly. The New Testament canon and the canonization of the New Testament. The New Testament canon emerged organically, much like the Old Testament, not on the basis of some hierarchical organization or ecclesiastical power, but simply on the usage of God's books. It is worth noting that as we've picked through this a little bit, the Catholic Church accepts the same 27 books of the New Testament that we do. In fact, most organizations in the religious world accept the same 27 books, but it does boil down to who has the say. Typically, this is an oral traditions versus written traditions, and sometimes we want to make a distinction, but we cannot. It's not biblical. I like the way the F.F. F. Bruce puts this. In a society like the Greco-Roman world of the early Christian centuries, where writing was the regular means of preserving and, tr and transmitting material deemed worthy of remembrance, the idea of relying on oral traditions for the recording of the deeds and words of Jesus and the apostles would not have generally commended itself. You know what he's saying? He's saying people wrote things down that were important like we still do today. You write something down so that you don't forget it. Well, it's the same thing they did with God's Word. They wrote it down so that it would be preserved for all posterity. Bruce goes on to say, We do not know by whom or in what place the first edition of Paul's collected letters was produced. What is important is this. From the early century, early second century onwards, Paul's letters circulated not singly, but as a collection. In fact, folks, the first reference of this may be 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16, where Peter references the epistles of Paul, a plurality, a collection. And so it was a collection that Christians of the 2nd century and later knew them, both orthodox and heterodox. The codex into which the letters were copied by their first editor constituted a master copy in which all the subsequent copies of the letters were based. There are relatively few variant readings in the textual traditions of Paul's letters which may go back to a time earlier than the formation of the Pauline corpus where they were collected and circulated, a time when they still circulated singly. The oldest surviving copy of the Pauline corpus is the Chester Beatty manuscript, P46, written about A.D. 200. Of this codex, we have 46 folio, or excuse me, 86 folios as out of the original 104. That's kind of like pages. So we've got about 84 pages of the original 104. We can safely assume, we can safely assert that we do not have every single word ever spoken by Jesus or the apostles, much less everything ever written by them. Paul even acknowledges this, or at least seems to acknowledge this. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, I wrote to you in my other epistle. Well, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. So he's talking about an epistle that apparently went to Corinth before this one. So that would be a letter that, that precedes this one, or Colossians 4 and verse 16. When this epistle is read among you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. A couple of things about that very quickly. Some of the oldest scholars going back as far as the 2nd century believe this to be the letter Ephesians. 
because the book of uh, the letter of the Ephesians, actually in the oldest manuscripts we have, doesn't have the word in Ephesus. The Christians in Ephesus is not in that particular manuscript. So the old theory is this is actually that letter right here. By the way, he says from Laodicea. May not be where the letter is originally sent, but maybe where the letter is now sitting. So observe that. Now, there is no question there's a gap between the years where things were orally taught and things were put into writing. But that in no way undermines the scriptures themselves. Sometimes these passages are brought up. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which, were taught, which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Sometimes people want to say, see, traditions, oral taught traditions, and verbal or written traditions are separate things. But that doesn't have to be that way, folks. It doesn't have to be that way at all. Or 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6, the very last statement there. Not according to the tradition which you received from us. Anything Paul taught in a written letter would be consistent with what he taught verbally, or it's not from God. In fact, he even says in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6, that, that you may learn not to think beyond what is written. Well, that was the goal. That was the goal he had in his writing. Or even, I like this, in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9, that's the passage we just looked at, the other epistle. But notice verse 10 and 11, he goes on and talks briefly about some of the content that was in that lost letter. He says, yet I certainly did not mean, meaning I didn't mean in that other letter, to not keep company with the sexually immoral people of the world. He said, what I meant was that you not keep company with a brother who's sexually immoral. So he, in some degree, tells us what was in that lost letter. By the way, that supports very plainly, very clearly, reinforces the concept that if, if it is required to make one complete, if it is required to equip him for every good work, if it pertains to life and godliness, as 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, and 2 Peter 1 and verse 3 tells us, then we have it. We have it. So what about the lost books? Why were they excluded? Was it like Da Vinci Code argues, political pursuits and power and control and just oppression of the masses? Not hardly. This is a listing of the Gospels, the lost, quote-unquote, lost Gospels. Notice this is a rather long list. The Gospel of Thomas, of Peter, the Ergaton Gospel, the Gospel of Mary, the secret Gospel of Mark, of Judas, of the Ebionites, of Hebrews, of Philip, of the Egyptians, the Gospel of Bartholomew, the Proto-Evangelium of James, Arabic Gospel of Childhood, the Gospel of Nicodemus, of Joseph the Carpenter, the history of Joseph the Carpenter, the passing of Mary, the Gospel of the Nativity of Mary, the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, of Andrew, of Matthias, of Barnabas, the Gospel of Marcion. Of all of that listing, the Gospel of Thomas is probably the most famous of that list. In fact, it's often the most contested. And sometimes they go as far as to say it is the long-lost fifth Gospel. It was discovered in 1945. When they found it, they realized it was part of an earlier manuscript they found back in 1890s. Both of these represented a manuscript that was lost from about 200 A.D. We could spend a little bit of time discussing all of this, but just in brief, I'll give you a few things worth consideration. It is inconsistent with the irrefutable Gospels in style, content, genre, and even in the descriptions of Jesus. Number two, doctrinally, it is inconsistent. It's disconnected. So much as number 114, it's 114 sayings of Jesus, secret sayings. The 114th one says, the female element must make itself male. Does that sound like something Jesus said in any other Gospel? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Number three, it is Gnostic, meaning there was secret knowledge that was given to these people and not to others. Did, was God in the business of hiding things from people? The grace of God has appeared to all men, bringing salvation, Paul said in Titus 2. Uh, this does not kosher up to that. Number four, there's no real linguistic harmony between it and the authentic Gospels. Please understand, you can look at all four of, gospel, all four of the Gospel accounts and you'll see patterns of phrases You'll see a word that's repeated in all four accounts. You'll see things like, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's repeated, it's repeated, it's repeated. None of it is in the Gospel of Thomas. Not one time. Nothing. You could go look beyond just the Gospel of Thomas to all of these contested Gospels. The manuscript evidence, going back to the earliest and oldest manuscripts we have, never has a lost Gospel put with the true four. Never. You can look back at some of our oldest manuscripts and there'll be two Gospels together or three Gospels together or four Gospels together. But you never find an ancient manuscript where it's the Gospel of Matthew and Mark and, and Peter or the Gospel of John and Thomas and Mark. You don't see it. 
It's always Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. One of the variations of those four. That is the manuscript evidence. You can't deny that. So why don't we accept all of those, of that particular listing? I'll give you a couple of reasons. Number one, they have been universally recognized by scholarship as second century or even later in some cases writings, meaning they are inconsistent with the first century works. They're inconsistent with the usage of names. Now, I know that sounds a little funny, but recognize names have a unique place in both geography and history. You say names like Bonnie and Clyde, and you immediately think of rural southern United States in the early 1900s, or my oldest daughter. And so you, you, but you immediately recognize a name because it's specific. And yet when you look at these, they are not consistent. Individuals, places, and cities, descriptions of travel, they're inconsistent with the verifiable, true, authentic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're disconnected chronologically and theologically. Folks, that's a problem. That is a problem. All of these things are consistent with the four and inconsistent with others. And in fact, they're consistent with not just the four, but all canonical works and inconsistent with others. What about the other lost works? The epistle of Pseudo-Barnabas, or Barnabas, the epistle, to, the epistle to the Corinthians, which is Clement. The shepherd of Hermas, the didact, teaching of the twelve, the epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians, the seven epistles of Ignatius, the acts of Peter, acts of John. Some of these are first century works, 70, 80, 90. Some of them are second century. That's the reason I have them separated. Here's a, another listing of more works. The real first Corinthians, which is arguably not arguably from me, but arguably from their end, the 1 Corinthians 5 verse 9 reference. I don't believe it is, for the record. Ancient homily, or the second epistle of Clement, the apocalypse of Peter, Acts of Paul and Thecla, epistle to the Laodiceans, the gospel according to the Hebrews, Acts of Andrew, of Thomas, of Paul. That may be the same work as listed earlier. It's a little muddy. The Acts of Matthias, of Philip, of Thaddeus, the epistle of our Lord, the six letters of Paul to Seneca, apocalypse of Peter, Paul, Thomas, Stephen, second apocalypse of James, of Messos, of Dosatheos, and then unknown before 1946, com completely unknown, these three works. The secret book of John, the traditions of Matthias, the dialogue of the Savior. Now, some of these, well, all of these, can be lumped together. Why don't we accept those? Why don't we accept all of those? Number one, none of them are circulated like the canonical writings. Some of them were circulated temporarily or in a specific region in a very limited way, but none of them were circulated as widespread, as obvious as the truly canonical works. No, not only, this is, this is impressive, listen very carefully, not only do canonical manuscripts outnumber apocryphal ones almost four to one, but there are more manuscripts of the Gospel of John than there are the apocryphal books combined. There's more shreds of the Gospel of John from the dirt than all the apocryphal works combined. That's part of one of the, that's one of the reasons why we don't have them in our canon. Number two, they were never viewed as more than semi-canonical in any ancient document and the, an, uh, the manuscript evidence again argues that. The only logical conclusion you can come to from looking at the evidence of the manuscripts is these might have been in popularity in specific places. In, in small groups, in small areas, but not widespread were they accepted in any form, any fashion at all whatsoever. Number three, no major canon or church council included them. That one doesn't really matter very much in the overall discussion. But as it is thrown in with the rest of these issues, it is rather telling. They were universally rejected. Further than that, the temporary and limited acceptance of these particular works, it's very easy to see why. You slap a name on something like the epistle of Peter, it's bound to attract some attention. It's bound to be circulated somewhere. And that's exactly the case with these particular works. Once these issues were sorted through, once they navigated some of these, it became very easy to identify what was truly inspired and therefore what was not. What was canonical and what was not. What is awesome about this discussion what is powerful about this discussion, you knew it was coming. You knew at some point I was going to say it. The canon emerged organically. It emerged organically. The New Testament canon are the books that could not be refuted, they could not be ignored, they could not be silenced. In fact, it's so telling you can actually use these quote-unquote lost books to help clear up the true canon of Scripture. As an example, Clement, 
from Rome in AD 95, never claimed to be apostolic, never claimed to be inspired, and yet what he does do is quote all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, quotes Acts, 1 Corinthians, Titus, Hebrews, and 1 Peter. And so somebody might say, well, Clement obviously viewed those as scriptures. I don't care what Clement thought. I don't care how he viewed these works. What it irrefutably proves is they, these books were in circulation. Clement had them in Rome. Now, not only does Clement circulate these books, Ignatius in A.D. 70 to A.D. 110, which he was in the city Antioch, north of, uh, north of Jerusalem. He quotes Matthew, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, James, and 1 Peter. You go on a little bit further, you've got Clement of Alexandria in Egypt in 150 to 212, Tertullian, uh, Tertullian in Carthage, which is northwestern Africa, in 160 to 220, Hippolytus in Rome, 8170 to 235, Justin Martyr in Judea, 133, Origen in Alexandria, Eusebius in Caesarea, Irenaeus in Smyrna. All, all of these men account for 36,389 direct quotes of apostolic scripture. Now, if you're familiar with the geography of that part of the world, you just picture for a moment where all of the places that these men were. And yet they're referencing these books. It, it, it absolutely proves that the scriptures were available and in high usage and high demand, and I don't care about their theology. Once in a while somebody will ask me, well, what do you think about what Origen said? I don't care what Origen said. I think it's fascinating that he quotes Scripture. I think that pertains to the canon Scripture, sure, or the canon discussion, but I don't care about his theology. He wasn't inspired. He was not an apostle. How do you know that he wasn't a heretical writer? You don't. How do you know that he didn't fall in line with Hymenaeus and Philetus, like Paul said in 2 Timothy, that doctrines they were teaching was cancer? It was spreading like cancer. See, that's the problem, folks. You don't. But when you have truly apostolic works. It stands out. Some of these books, some of the New Testament was not circulated as widely as some of the other works. We need to acknowledge that. I think that the easiest way to argue it is the, the size. You, you look at works like Jude and 2 Peter and 2 and 3 John, they're, they're tiny. In fact, Jude is 600 words in the Greek language. Everybody that picked up a bulletin tonight, this morning, my article on the back was 504 words if you count my name. That's a little bitty document, folks. And yet, well, I'm going, to say a little, I'm going to say a little on that later. Point being, the canon was very clearly defined. It was very clearly defined by, by the Christians of the first century. The church did not define it. The church sought to recognize it. The core New Testament was quickly recognized, being very clear by the late first century, early second century. The books that made it up absolutely could not be Ignored. Michael Kruger, in an excellent book on this subject, says the core consisted of the four Gospels, Paul's epistles, Acts, 1 Peter, 1 John, perhaps a few others. As Barton notes, astonishingly early, the great central core of the present New Testament was already being treated as the main authoritative source for Christians. This is not to say, of course, that by this point the boundaries of the emerging canon had solidified. Even though there was an established core, the edges of the canon were still fuzzy. There was an ongoing discussion over a handful of books like 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, and Revelation. Apocryphal books still played active roles in certain portions, emphasis mine, of the early church. Nevertheless, the discussion of these disputed books would take place within a context where the main canonical foundation had already been laid. Thus, whatever their outcome, by the middle of the, of the second century, the overall canonical direction of early Christianity had been determined. Therefore, dramatic claims that the canon was not finalized until the fourth century may be true on a technical level, but often miss the larger and more important point, namely that the core of the canon had already been in place and exhibiting scriptural authority for centuries. That is a, a, an absolute statement made from the manuscripts. It's a statement made from the records, the historical accounts. Dan Wallace is a foremost scholar on the canon of Scripture. He's a brilliant individual. Can, uh, Catholics would say the canon is an authoritative listing of books. Protestants would say that the canon is a list of authoritative books. Where the word authoritative goes is key. Is the canon a list, excuse me, is the canon an authoritative list of books or a list of authoritative books? If an authoritative list of books, we need to see some authority that grants the authority to the Scriptures. When you look at the universal church councils, there's not a single council that says this is what is Scripture. 
No universal council that says these are the books that go into the New Testament. So we don't have an authoritative list of books. There's also a problem with the Catholic definition of this. If you say that this is an authoritative list, then you must be, there must be some authority that's higher than the New Testament or the Scriptures that gives it that authority. There actually is an authority higher than the New Testament, but it's not tradition and it's not church councils. It's Jesus Christ himself. He is the canon. Listen to that. He is the canon. He is the standard the New Testament conforms to, and that's really what the idea of canon is, a standard. Folks, once you have the irrefutable works, then you pick through, the discern, or discernibly pick through, any other work that's attributed to the apostles. Now, who gets to determine that? Is this where the Catholic Church swoops in and save us all, saves us all from heresy, or is there some other thing at work here? Now, please appreciate, the process of canonization, as we've observed several times already, was fraught with disagreement. There were challenges, there were, there were obstacles they had to overcome, but that kind of was to be expected. God delivered this information in stages in history. And by the way, I do think it is remarkable that the Word itself came to a general place of agreement, that, that there is general unity on these books in spite of all the chaos and diversity. Messiness means they were selective. It means they were selective. Let's discuss criteria of canonicity. All Scripture. Uh, please understand something. You can actually look at a number of different scholars and you can find any number of them that will either support your method of canonicity or else deny it. And you can find a lot of brilliant people that renounce the faith, they do not believe in God, and so they look at the canon of Scripture and they're going to pick it apart. Be careful about who you listen to. Be careful about what you listen to. The argument has always been that the canon is not self-authenticating. In other words, we have all Scripture. The statement there, but how do we know what is all Scripture? That verse doesn't actually tell us. There's a sense in which that's true. It says all Scripture, but doesn't tell us what is Scripture. Just that it is God-breathed. But that does not mean that we are without any help. Multiple ways to determine canonicity. We're going to look at just one, really. The self-authenticating method that people don't believe actually can exist. Three attributes. They are self-correcting and they are self-supportive. Apostolic origins, divine qualities, and corporate reception. One attribute not only supports the other two, but corrects when it needs to. A great example of that is the shepherd of Hermas. Shepherd of Hermas is divine, has divine qualities. It is doctrinally consistent with all the canonical works. Why was it refuted then? Because it was a second century work. Very obvious, it had no apostolic origins. And as a result, it did not have a wide reception. It was not corporately received across the brotherhood of the day. And so this pattern actually follows in line. Let's discuss the apostolic origins. If it doesn't have an apostolic association, it obviously cannot be apostolic in nature. The criteria for this actually began during the apostles' lives themselves. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. One is given the word of wisdom by the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge, to another discerning spirits. So Paul mentions a passage we kind of looked at this morning. Paul mentions discerning spirits, the miraculous gift to discern words. Or John would say in 1 John 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. By this you know. By this you know the Spirit of God. Paul mentions in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 2, he said that you may not be shaken in word or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as if from me. Obviously, it seems that there were letters being circulated in the time of the Apostle Paul that were not from him but were claiming to be from him. And so he's saying, don't be troubled by this. So he actually goes on to say, well, here's what you can do, folks. You look for my signature. And several letters conclude with this. He says, this is my own hand, this is my own hand, this is my own hand, which I give in all my epistles. He's saying, this is truly and authentically mine. It is my work, distinguishing it from any other. This was happening in the first century. We need to recognize that. It had to be an apostle, Matthew or John or Paul, or a close companion of the apostle, Luke, who traveled with Paul, or Mark, who traveled with Peter and Paul. Many New Testament documents actually don't include an author's name. You can look at the Gospel accounts or Acts or Hebrews, to name a few. They don't have a name attributed to them. They are anonymous. 
All the Gospels are anonymous, and yet, and yet they were circulated widely at this time. You, you can look back, even if it didn't date to a... Or excuse me, you can look back at these works that, that, that were anonymous, yet dated back to the apostolic period. And that's part of what we actually look at. That's part of how we determine this particular discussion. All four of the Gospels, and yet, with their anonymity, were circulated wider than any other New Testament document, folks. That alone, I think, is actually evidence that supports their authenticity. They didn't need a name on them. They knew them. They didn't have to put Mark's gospel on it until later because everybody that received it the first hundred years knew it was Mark's gospel and knew it was truly authentic, truly apostolic. Even if it dated back to when they were alive, you could discount it as not canonical. Even if it was doctrinally sound, it had to date to them. It had to date back to their time period. We can look at the writings of the first couple of centuries, the very end of the first century, very early of the second century that supports all of this. These books in wide circulation, some of which we've already referenced. The divine qualities, orthodoxy, it has to be consistent with the teachings of God's truly breathed writings. If it is inconsistent with apostolic teaching, then obviously it's not from an apostle. And again, a book could be orthodox. A, good, a book could be doctrinally consistent, but if it didn't meet the other criteria, it was dismissed. It had to be apostolic in its origin, it had to have divine qualities, and it had to have a corporate reception. All three worked together or it was absolutely dismissed and rejected. Canonical books are not only books where Christ is the speaker through the apostles, but also books where Christ is the subject. Or we could say that the canonical books are those that have both apostolic origins from Christ and divine qualities. They speak of Christ. If they had these two qualities, it was inevitable that there was a corporate reception. It was inevitable that they were going to be circulated widely and across the brotherhood of the time. Not only do, we te do they test it against New Testament apostolic work, but they also tested it against God's Old Testament. If it was inconsistent somewhere, it was cause for concern. The corporate reception or Catholicity, that word there, Catholic, means universal, not Roman Catholic Church. So they looked at the Christians of the time to gather evidence. It's important to note that this alone does not determine canonicity. This in conjunction with the other two. And this no way reflects the revisionist history of the interpretation of the Roman Catholic Church. The church did not choose the canon. The canon, in a sense, chose itself. It imposed itself upon the church. In, in this way, the church played a role similar to a thermometer, not a thermostat. Both provide information of the temperature in a room, but both have different functions. One determines it, one reflects it. This is where the Roman Catholic Church mindset kind of gets a little hung up on this particular issue. Who has the authority to make these calls? Not man, not church councils, not other ecclesiological systems. If the other two attributes were there, this one was inevitable. If it was apostolic in its origination, if it was apostolic from them, and if it had the divine qualities of doctrinally consistent, it was inevitable, folks. It was going to be circulated. It couldn't be stopped. If all... Scripture, if all Scripture is given by God, then we can assume, folks, if it was lost, if, if it is required to bring one, equip one to good works, all good works, we can safely conclude we have all of it. We should assume there are other works of apostolic origins and other works of divine qualities that were not circulated. The letter potentially referenced in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 9. It was absolutely apostolic, it was absolutely divine quality, or had divine qualities, and yet it was not received widely. It had limited reception. Why? I don't know. That was God's purposes for some reason. God didn't want it circulated wider than that, and so it wasn't. It was dismissed. We can look at these books that are sometimes called lost. We can look at these books that are sometimes misplaced or somehow forgotten. But folks, when we look at those, we have no reason to believe that we need them. We have no reason to conclude that they're lost accidentally, that they were lost and, and well, well, you know, we just, I don't know what we'll do now. No, no, we can safely conclude, folks, that what we have is absolutely what God intended to give us, what is canonical. Now, please appreciate, I, I, I like this observation. How can we recognize a book? How can we recognize a book as 
or its canonicity unless we actually have the book. If it's lost, it was lost for a reason probably. If it was lost, we have no reason to believe that we need it. You, you think about all of these different works. Some books were certainly inspired and some books were not. We have some books that God determined to put in the canon and some books that God determined not to put in the canon. And his choices, his decision. John's gospel, for example, was part of canon the minute the ink touched the page. Paul's quote-unquote lost letters were not, and God has a reason for that, I'm sure. They had a limited point, limited in their application. We have no reason, no reason to search for these lost letters, quote-unquote. The little line break there, about halfway through that, actually I guess it's the, bo the bottom line break. Therefore, canonical books, as we've de defined them here, cannot be lost. If they are lost, then they were never canonical books to begin with. So even if we were to discover Paul's lost letter in the desert sands today, we would, have, we would not place it in the canon as the 28th book. Instead, we would simply recognize that God had not preserved this book to be permanent foundation for the church. Putting such a letter in the canon now would not change that fact. It would not make a book foundational that clearly never was. Think about that. If the book was lost, do we not believe in an omnipotent God? This really goes back to a theological issue. Do you believe God's powerful enough to preserve His Word? Well, I do. And so we must conclude if it's lost, there was probably a reason for that. Sometimes this is brought up, 2 Kings 22. The lost books of Moses that were found under the reign of Josiah. A couple of observations if you're carefully reading the historical account of that occasion. Number one, they, uh, those books were never really lost. They were ignored. And number two, they were not found for the first time. Very, very quickly, let, let's notice a few things. This is, we're wrapping up. You've been very patient and you've listened very well. And I know I've moved very quickly. Some of the New Testament books that are the most disputed, we might say. The book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, because of its anonymity, is often contested. It attests itself, though, to its apostolic origins. Hebrews 2 and verse 3, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed, notice this, to us by those who heard him. That is a clear line of apostolic origins. That is a clear statement of apostolic connection. Further than that, it was support, that is supported by its wide circulation at the very close of the first century and the writings of those early Christians. Please observe again. A lot of the same names are circulating here. Clement in the city of Rome in 95, Polycarp in Smyrna who lived... 70 to 156, Justin Martyr in AD 133. And there are others, folks, but that alone gives us a wide geographical reference point. This book was circulated pretty fast for a book that was not apostolic, if such was actually the case. Now, doctrinally, if it was inconsistent, if it was way out of bounds, then we would have cause for concern. And yet it is... Consistent. It presents challenges, and there's no doubt about that, but it's consistent. It's consistent. So now you have all three in reference to this disputed book, book of Hebrews. you got all three. Apostolic origins, divine qualities, and corporate reception. The book is clearly, clearly part of the true canon of the New Testament. The book of James. It was at one time disputed and claimed to have been a second century pseudonymous work. That, has, that viewpoint has almost totally been abandoned at this point. Now they dated about AD 40 to 62. That puts us in the right time period. Traditionally, it was attributed to the Lord's brother, James, and if such is the case, then its apostolic origin is very clear. But let's posit for the moment that it is anonymous, just for the sake of argument. Consider the circulation it went through. This is far beyond a regional acceptance of the work. Clement in 1st Clement, Rome, AD 95-96, the shepherd of Hermas, 2nd century. Irenaeus in Smyrna, mid-late 2nd century. Clement of Alexandria, 150-212. Origen, also Alexandria, 185-253-254. Eusebius in Caesarea, in 325. All attest to this book's wide circulation, its authenticity. If it was, or all of that, plus its doctrinal consistencies provide us with ample evidence to accept its authenticity. Folks, books like this did not get circulated. Again, go back to something I said previously. Look at the other works that were out there. The, the list of 30-something books from the New Testament. None of them were circulated like this one. None of them were quoted like this one. There is a distinction. 
Now, let's look at the, the book of James, or excuse me, the book of Jude. Often this is argued as synonymous or its pseudonymity. Some argue its authenticity. It's dated somewhere between 50 and sometimes as late as 80 in the first century. That still puts us in the right time period, and I think that is important in the discussion. Even if it is synonymous, even if it could be argued that it is truly synonymous that would not necessarily refute its apostolicity, its content is Jude's even if the pen wasn't. Its content is Jude's. Please understand why I keep emphasizing it is first century, it's first century, it's first century. Because one simple reason, folks, the apostles would have still been alive, many of them. And so when these letters were being circulated, there were apostles who could oversee this process. There were apostles who could vouch for the credibility of this work or this particular thing. By the way, it goes beyond the apostles. There were still miraculous abilities. The discerning of spirits. We looked at it a second ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The book of Jude, even though it's only 600 words in Greek, was circulated fairly widely. You look at the Muratorian canon, with the earliest listing of the canonical books, which some suppose was in Rome or Asia Minor originally. 170 includes it. Tertullian in northwest Africa and Carthage in 160-220. Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Eusebius, all attest to knowing this particular work. Now, doctrinally, it presents no challenge. It's consistent. Sometimes it's brought up, well, it says Enoch prophesied. So now you've either got it attesting to the credibility of some ancient Old Testament apocryphal work. No, you don't. Key word in that, word, in that phrase, prophesied. Prophesied. It doesn't say anything about him writing anything. Folks, there were a lot of prophets, and there were a lot of prophecies. Not all of them made it into the text. And so that does not present any challenge whatsoever. There's not enough evidence to suggest anything less than an absolute God breathed piece of writing. The book of Jude stands canon. The letter of 2 Peter. Perhaps no book is contested more than this one. No book more challenged than this one. Much like Jude, modern scholarship tries to argue that it is pseudonymous and they date it as an early 2nd century writing. But traditionally, it was dated in the mid-60s. Well, folks, it would have to be mid-60s because Peter died in the mid-60s. So it would have to at least be before that. There's stronger evidential arguments to support the traditional dating because you can look at other works. You can look at 1 Clement, 95-96. You can look at the Apocalypse of Peter, 81-10, who seem to have knowledge of this particular writing. You look at Justin Martyr in Judea. You look at Hippolytus in Rome. You look at Irenaeus in Smyrna, Clement of Alexandria, Origen of Alexandria, Eusebius. All seem to make reference to this particular work. Even later Christians seem to acknowledge its controversial placement, but it is nevertheless canonical. Jerome, Athanasius, Gregory of Nazianzus, and Augustine. By the way, there's no doctrinal inconsistencies in this particular work. It is consistent. All of those negative things against this work, and you still have substantial support for its canonicity, even over the best of the rejected works. There is... More evidence for the authenticity of 2 Peter than for any other book of antiquity. Think about that for just a second. There's more evidence for 2 Peter, the most contested New Testament book. There's more evidence for its authenticity than the other, bur other, other books of antiquity. Now let, let's consider, we, we're very near the end here. 2nd and 3rd John, wide circulation. Polycarp in Smyrna, Ignatius in Antioch, Muratorian listing, Rome to Asia Minor, Irenaeus in Smyrna, Clement of Alexandria, Hippolytus of Rome, Cyprian of Carthage, Dionysius of Alexandria, Origen, Eusebius, all reference this book, all reference these books. There's even a third century codex with high page numbers that they found, which seems, along with all the other evidence and references, to support this book was, 2nd and 3rd John were circulated with other Johannan works in more than likely a Johannan codex. It is only fair to acknowledge some of those writers mention both. Some of them only reference one or the other. But it is very clear they were there. Please notice something too, folks. I think this is one of the more substantial, powerful evidences supporting these works. You look at 2nd and 3rd John and you look at Jude... Folks, they would have fit on nearly a single piece of papyrus. And yet, they're circulated across the known world? That is 
That is a testament to its authenticity by itself. The fact that we have any of these works left over, a, page, a single page, folks. A single page is what the document would have fit on. The fact that we have any manuscripts of them at all is, a test, is an attestation of their authenticity and the fact that they are truly God-breathed. Wide circulation. And again, no doctrinal issues whatsoever. And finally, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation. Natural tendency to question this book's authenticity and its truly apostolic origins because of the style and content of the book. That, that alone would cause anyone to question its authenticity. You read through it? My class just, we got through this book and I, I nearly drove people away from the Lord over that book. I'm kidding. That was a challenging study. But it, it, it is. It's a challenging study. It's worth noting, folks, that the earlier Christians did not doubt its authenticity or its apostolicity. You look at the various works, that trend didn't seem to start until the 4th century. Earlier Christians didn't doubt it. Later Christians, 4th century, did doubt it. And more than likely, that was because of a misunderstanding and therefore a misuse of the book. It was not so much because of its true authenticity. You look at the works who did quote it. Didac in early 2nd century. Shepherd of Hermas, mid-2nd century. Papias. Papias. Justin Martyr in Judea. Irenaeus in Smyrna, the Muratorian canon. All attest to this book's wide circulation and defend its absolute authenticity. All from the 2nd century, folks. All from the 2nd century. The, eventually, the overwhelming support couldn't be refuted and it was accepted universally by all the Christians that followed later. And again, it may present doctrinal challenges, but it is doctrinally consistent with the books we have. Folks, if there's that much support for the disputed by some category, does that not impress us of the overall integrity of this book? I have listed somewhere around 99 other books including maybe a few that are in Scripture that I didn't actually mention. There are books of the kings sometimes mentioned. Folks, uh, again I say, all Scripture is indeed given by the inspiration of God. And we can have great confidence in that what we have before us is all Scripture. Uh, please don't let the Da Vinci Code or Bart Ehrman's of the world or the Roman Catholic Church or some other ecumenical organization confuse you on this issue. None of them gave us the Bible. None of them chose books. None of them rejected books. What we have is what could not be refuted. It could not be ignored. It could not be silenced. Why? Because nobody can stop the purposes of God. It was God's will that salvation be made to all men. Salvation would be made available to all men. And folks, the books we have before us, we can have great confidence in. The process was messy at times. There's no doubt about that. But we ended up with exactly what God wanted us to have. We need to know that. And our kids need to know that. And we need to try to help other people know that. I appreciate your kind attention tonight. I don't necessarily expect any questions because I went a whole lot longer than Russ did when we did this special study a couple months ago. So I've, I'm going to do this. If you have any questions, you write them down. Get them to me, email them to me, uh, text them to me, put them on a manuscript, bury them in the ground, and tell me where they are in your yard. And I'll go dig them up, and I'll try to answer your question any way I can. I appreciate your kind attention. You can consider yourselves dismissed.